Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Watches and Style channel. This is Young Brando. We ended the last year on a very positive note for the horological community, and we learned that on the eve of its 130th anniversary, Universal Genève or Universal had been acquired by Breitling, or more properly, uh, the ownership group behind Breitling, the partners group. Um, and I made a longer video on this that, that reflects my take. Uh, but overall, I am very optimistic uh, because I think the executives that lead uh, Breitling and the brain trust that guides them has done overall very positive things for Breitling in terms of uh, reigniting that spark, reviving their heritage. And I think they are well placed to, to do something quite similar with Universal as well. And I was particularly uh, emboldened or teased uh, more properly uh, by some public statements made by those executives and from uh, what I've heard through other collectors and insiders uh, because they are thinking of placing Universal, uh, situating Universal in the market as perhaps a more high horological and boutique uh, sibling to the Breitling brand, which I think is a great idea. For this video, I'm just going to talk about a few watches that I think uh, they should bring back uh, for the new uh, Universal brand, for the energized uh, modern reawakening of this legend for vintage collectors and i have made a selection which i'm going to share with you in this video and i think there can hardly be a better place to start than the universal pole router which has been the point of entry for many to the world of vintage watches and of course that has has a lot to do with its accessibility. Uh, even though the price point has been steadily uh, rising over the last few years, this is still a very attractive price point for many to start thinking about vintage watches, to start uh, investing in vintage watches. And what makes uh, the pole router so appealing is at least in part the name behind it the cachet behind it uh, because this is a watch that was designed by a youth by a youthful Gerard Janta when he was nearly 23 years old uh, he was uh, commissioned by Universal uh, who were in turn given the brief uh, by the Scandinavian airline systems to create a watch uh, that would commemorate, that would honor their achievements of instituting the first transpolar intercontinental flight, uh, the first uh, intercontinental flight by a polar route, hence the name, between Copenhagen and Los Angeles. So the design aesthetic of the watch and uh, the visual appeal of the pole router perhaps weighs quite heavily on the consciousness of, of collectors. And I think that has a lot to do with how this watch is very familiar and quirky at the same time. 
it has many elements that would be otherwise familiar to uh, enthusiasts of other watches of proximate designs you might say first of all uh, the case uh, you are seeing perhaps the most canonical version here even though the paul router comes perhaps in countless iterations in so many different versions but this particular case uh, with the so-called liar lugs or twisted lugs of course resonates heavily with that speedmaster professional case because they were in fact made by the same case maker Igen and Frère uh, and in a similar vein you have of course this inner bezel um, which is often uh, engine turned or completely fluted which of course echo uh, with those familiar uh, bezels from Rolex Datejusts so there are all these elements that uh, pull you in, uh, that make you feel familiar, uh, that resonate quite heavily with you, uh, even as this watch also offers its own singular pleasures. Um, one of the most beautiful details, if you ask me, is the that asymmetric opening, that trapezoid shape of the date window uh, at three o'clock. And in the original versions, and this is one of the ways of knowing that you are in fact on your way to source uh, a better, if not the best vintage example, those trapezoid date windows are in fact matched with a magnifier of the same shape uh, on the crystal. So there's something about the pole router that is at once uh, also familiar uh, and also very exciting, new and full of character. And, and that design aesthetic, uh, of course, sealed with the autograph of Gerard Janta constitutes a great part of, of this piece's appeal. But the pole router is more than that. It is more than uh, its accessibility and affordability. It's more than just its design aesthetic. It was also uh, one of those uh, early examples of uh, self-winding pieces with a micro rotor caliber which uh, of course really complements its larger design aesthetic as well making it just a very slender uh, sleek dress watch that can be worn really close uh, to the wrist and of course uh, if you pop the case back uh, I think the architecture of the micro rotor caliber is also always very interesting to observe. Um, and of course, the other exciting part is uh, the variations on the theme, uh, right? There are so many different uh, reference websites that go with this particular model. And more recently, uh, there is a Paul Router book uh, that was just released, actually, and the timing could not have been better uh, in hindsight. I don't think they have actually planned it that way, but somehow the release of the Paul Router book more or less coincided with uh, Breitling's announcement of the acquisition. Now, those variations are both good and bad when you look at it from the point of, of revival, because uh, on the one hand, 
you want to build an entire catalog, you want to have uh, a great variety of watches that would appeal to uh, different kinds of tastes that would uh, that could be worn on a number of different occasions. So chances are that the pole router would be uh, their dress watch. I hope they don't give in to the temptation of uh, blowing everything up in size, blowing this up to at least 39, 40 millimeters. I think this can be something very elegant, preferably in precious metal, uh, perhaps like the pink gold example you are seeing here. Uh, time only or time and date, I think it would be just absolutely integral to a future Universal Genève lineup. Of course, um, most collectors would still pine for an example in stainless steel. And stainless steel or even titanium dress watches have uh, become a thing and, and have uh, started claiming their own share of the market so that can always be an option and that can also constitute a nice entry point to this revived re-energized universal genève uh, line as well uh, of course the pole router as i mentioned uh, came in so many different uh, flavors uh, the pole router sub uh, which also had some mil spec versions as well was uh, perhaps one of the most compelling uh, one of the most delectable of those flavors uh, in the super compressor case i think it has an even stronger appeal uh, it has an inner rotational bezel which kind of uh, takes care of that uh, system uh, without having to institute a lock um, because of course originally uh, those timing bezels were dive timers uh, so you would want to set it once and and make sure it doesn't actually get bumped uh, because that could literally decide on your fate but this is also a beautiful aesthetic for uh, a classic dive watch uh, with or without the pole router branding something like this i think could be amazing i think this would put most of the watches uh, that uh, go for a dive watch uh, that are called a diver in Breitling's current lineup to shame, but that's just my personal opinion. They may or may not want to dilute uh, that internal brand, that family line uh, as the Paul Router, so again, that's an interesting choice uh, that they will have to make, uh, whether they need to keep pole router and make it simply as an elegant, but also perhaps an entry level dress watch, uh, or whether they want to pair that up um, with a sportier version uh, with even a dive watch version as we have here. And even that had, of course, its own variations, which uh, is represented in an example here uh, with the uh, Art Deco numerals at the quarters and uh, a date window through a trapezoid opening at three o'clock with the magnifier to match it on the crystal. Um, you will see uh, the echoes of this design in another watch that I will show, which I think they just have to bring back. Uh, but for the pole router, 
they have a number of options. And even though I would like them to bring back all of them all at once, uh, I think ultimately it would be wise for them to settle on just one uh, and have that internal brand, have that iconic line, uh, perhaps dedicated to dress watches, probably in precious metal, but perhaps uh, they could also reimagine it in stainless steel at the entry level, but they have to remain focused. On that point, so should I. Uh, so the second uh, watch that also has some celebrity stardust sprinkled on it that I will share with you is the tri -compacts. And here we are looking at Eric Clapton when he was still the guitarist for Cream, uh, hanging out here with another uh, legendary guitarist, namely Jimi Hendrix. And he is wearing his triple calendar chronograph by Universal, which goes by the name tri -compacts, but this particular configuration, the collectors already have immortalized as the Eric Clapton. Um, of course, in addition to that association, uh, because Eric Clapton to us uh, watch collectors, to watch enthusiasts is more than a legendary uh, guitarist more than a great musician he's also a man of taste uh, someone who has been really influential uh, now for decades among watch collectors so that means it means a lot for this watch to be associated with his name in the first place but even without that association this watch has once again, a lot of charm, a lot of aesthetic cues uh, that have resonated with collectors in similar packages. Um, I don't even have to repeat what I said about the liar lug case. Uh, that's an integral part of the aesthetic that uh, almost everyone appreciates. There's also the panda dial. When you look at this dial, uh, it is very reminiscent of a similarly configured uh, Daytona from the same time period, right? From the 60s and even the latter part of the 60s. Of course, here you get uh, something a little more complicated. Uh, not only do you have a chronograph with three registers with the additional 12 hour counter, but you also have a triple calendar, which is in fact crowned at, at 12 o'clock as well with uh, a moon phase indicator too. Uh, and that puts all that uh, romanticism at the focal point of the watch and makes this watch even uh, more aesthetically appealing, perhaps, even though it otherwise, with its uh, plastic tachymeter bezel, with its panda dial configuration, um, it already resonates with the Paul Newman Daytona. So a tri compacts in some shape or form, I think is obligatory. Um, I'm almost sure that it's going to come back. And I think it would probably come back uh, in the form that has been kind of canonized in the 60s and associated with the proper name Eric Clapton. In this case, I might actually make a concession, I think, uh, from that from that vintage sizing, from those uh, throwback proportions, um, and it's just 36 millimeters in diameter, they might go for something bigger. 
Uh, and with these kinds of complications, they have some built-in excuse for that as well. I think this watch could look great in 39 millimeters too, um, especially if they go through the trouble of designing a movement from scratch for it. Uh, if they manage to keep it nicely proportioned, even as they uh, enlarge the dial a little bit more and the case diameter with that, I think that would make a lot of collectors really happy and it would also bring something new to the table, um, the likes of which really don't exist with this sporty aesthetic, with this uh, unique flair and with this throwback flavor. I think the Tri-Compax is a great watch. Uh, this is what they call Evil Clapton, kind of a reverse Panda configuration matched here with uh, a Geffrer uh, bracelet from the same period. Um, I think when it comes to the tri-compacts, again, I think it's it's almost a surefire choice for a comeback. I think it's almost certain that it would come back on a bracelet, and uh, I I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Uh, it's it's a great sporty interpretation of what is a very useful uh, complication, what is ultimately a great watch for everyday wear. So the Tri-Compacts in uh, a configuration, in a design that would reiterate or reinterpret the 60s version for uh, our time would be great. Um, as I was talking about that uh, Paul Router sub in uh, the version that had the Art Deco numerals, I had this particular chronograph in mind. This is the Universal Space Compacts. Um, it is actually much more in the mold of, of those iconic chronographs that we have uh, so far mentioned uh, the Omega Speedmaster, which became the Moonwatch, uh, the Rolex Cosmograph Daytona. Uh, in that same vein, uh, with that same uh, extraterrestrial aspiration, uh, Universal Genève uh, designed a watch called the Space Compacts. And uh, it is a chronograph that uh, is crossbred in so many ways with a dive watch as well, um, with these uh, rubber clad pushers. Uh, again, it's everything seems to be just right. There's a lot about this watch that is familiar. Uh, there's a lot about this watch that is very compelling since it brings together uh, two perennially popular genres of sports watch in one neat package, a diver and a chronograph in one, and puts it with this asymmetric uh, case design, um, the rubber pushers and that sole uh, Art Deco numeral at 12 ultimately blends it all together once again in a very unique uh, twist. Uh, a watch I think that is already quite uh, a strong uh, contender for one of the, uh, I think, some of the most underappreciated watches from the period. Uh, this would be a great piece to bring back, perhaps in a more limited edition, because I think it's a little out there uh, for today's taste. It's 
perhaps more for the aficionado than an average collector. So perhaps this is something that I'm partial towards. Uh, I'm being a little selfish in, in even asking for this, but I think um, since they are paying enough respect to the brand, since they are literally uh, investing in building it from scratch uh, in some sense, uh, they can, along with other chronographs, probably bring something, uh, bring back something like this. Uh, but I think uh, it's more certain, and these are, by the way, 40s examples of the tricompacts, as opposed to the 60s example that you are seeing here in the Eric Clapton and Evil Clapton. Um, but more than the space compacts, I think they might end up giving us something like this. Um, and if uh, we just looked at the tricompacts as uh, the weird cousin, a more complicated relative uh, of the Daytona from roughly the same time period, uh, what you're looking at here, which is uh, simply the universal compacts, is uh, perhaps uh, the forgotten uh, sibling or a step-sibling to the Daytona. Uh, these are, again, contemporary creations that are powered by the same uh, Vajou caliber 72 base and that have uh, very uh, similar uh, looks as well in terms of the panda and reverse panda dials, in terms of the tachymeters on the bezel inserts, and even in terms of the dimensions of the case as well. Maybe uh, the universal compacts might be a tad smaller, uh, but in either case, once again, you have a watch uh, that is in so many ways comparable to uh, the Rolex Daytona when it was its contemporary. And if it is brought back in the right way, again, uh, with uh, paying attention to not only the design, but also uh, the uh, inner workings of the mechanism with a movement that is actually designed from scratch uh, or reimagined from, from a vintage base, uh, you will be able to bring a watch like this uh, back by not only appeasing vintage collectors, by also offering, but also offering uh, the contemporary enthusiast something different, something that they can't get in any other brand. Um, I don't want to belabor this point, but uh, I have in mind here, as a negative example, uh, Breguet's recent revision of the Type 20, where they front-loaded uh, this high-beat, self-winding caliber as a really one of the core points of their new marketing campaign. Uh, forgetting that the appeal of the Type 20 was, in fact, its throwback quality and was its more compact and arguably more wearable dimensions compared to every other uh, sports or pilot's chronograph that was on the market. So now you have a uh, Breguet Type 20 that is 42 millimeters in diameter that is not particularly uh, thin or slender and that has, what, a modern high beat caliber? Do you really think people who want a high beat chronograph caliber look for a Type 20? Let's dispense ourselves of, of this uh, 
cognitive dissonance, really. There's no better word to describe it. Give collectors what they want, even as you offer uh, other enthusiasts something different, something that they can't get elsewhere. And um, I think a modernized version of the compacts, uh, which is affectionately called Nina Rindt, uh, because it was worn uh, by the widow of the famous uh, racing car driver, Jochen Rintz, as you can see here. Um, bringing this watch back uh, with a proprietary movement could be one of the best things that they can do as well. And Again, this can be done in so many different ways. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, a variation on the old theme. Not everything has to be panda or reverse panda dial. Uh, they can uh, have a little bit of fun, have a little bit of color uh, with bringing back some of these exotic dials that were used widely uh, at the time the compacts had had its version and even the tri compacts had certain variations uh, in the late 60s with uh, these exotic dials too so you have between uh, these various pieces you have the possibility of resurrecting the brand with an entire catalog with some internal diversity and with a significant distinction that would separate it from basically just about anything else on the market. And that is the kind of treatment that Universal deserves. Uh, and I also think that is also the kind of approach that would bring it uh, commercial success in the current market as well, because you don't have to reinvent the wheel, but you need to carve a very specific niche. Aesthetically, from the perspective of the design, everything is already there. As long as that is respected, as long as the proportions are not messed with in an unnecessary way, and as long as they start from within uh, building proprietary movements for these watches, that would then accommodate uh, the kind of uh, visual distinction that these designs already have. I think uh, they will have taken a big step uh, towards success. So I hope uh, they will bring at least some of these pieces back, hopefully uh, in the form uh, that I have underlined in each case. If you have liked this video, please don't forget to hit the like button. If you are not yet a subscriber, here's your chance to do so. I'm here with watch-related content practically every day. And this is a channel that is built simply around passion for and knowledge of wristwatches. So your participation in that community enriches the experience for everyone involved including me so i hope you will join us uh, and feel free to share the link far and wide with other enthusiasts and with fellow watch collectors uh, in the meantime please uh, leave a comment and let me know what you think let me know what models uh, universal should bring back for their revival and whether you have any more ideas, any original or unique takes as to how they should revise some of these designs, as to how 
they should perhaps rethink some of these models. Thank you again. Stay safe, stay healthy, wear and enjoy your watches. Take care, guys.